One, two, three, four. In this podcast, you will be here. Knights of Vader, Knights of Vader. Include, but it's not later. Who talk of Star Wars, not Reagans. We can truly prepare for the jump that follows this song. But hey, we gave it a try. So here's the Knights of Vader. Or they are divided For equal sequel Kate and love they fight I know that we are just musicians hired And their time is up So here's the night so later Impressive Most impressive A big thank you to An Inspirority Complex for providing our theme song It is September 28th, 2021 My name is Zach Weber and joining me today is premier Canadian collector Chris Porteous. Very happy to be here for this special recording. And we have the Bard of Vader, Rob. Yeah, Chris, I think you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, I'm so happy to be here for this special occasion. <laughs> and we saved the best for last. We have a genuine treat for our audience today. We have legendary Star Wars author who was there at the onset of the saga. Mr. Alan Dean Foster, thank you so much for joining Knights of Vader for this special occasion. My pleasure. Glad to be here. All right. So for those of you who are late to the party, Alan Dean Foster is an American science fiction writer, and he has written dozens of original novels and adapted many of our all-time favorite films, including the original Star Wars, The Force Awakens, the Alien Trilogy, and many more. It's great to have you here. And uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. It's nice to be here wherever here is. It, it that's it's the place between <laughs> between places, I think. Yeah. So <laughs> I've heard you say in another interview that um originally early on it was uh maybe a producer from Star Wars no uh, had noticed Ice Rigger and uh, that's sort of what opened the door for you to uh, get a meeting with Lucas and talk about the novelization. Could you maybe take us a little bit through sort of what do you remember about those initial meetings, just sort of like the experience of it? Did anything stand out to you at the time? Well, I don't know who did it. To this day, I don't know who the person was who passed my name along as a possible, possible writer of the novelization. Uh, but after that, my agent got a call, and I was asked to meet with George's lawyer in Hollywood at the time, presumably so they could ascertain whether or not I was a secret child killer or, you know, that I, I wouldn't mess everything up. <laughs> and I did that and apparently passed that test. And they said, we, well, you need, you need to go out to Industrial Light Magic and have George vet you, basically, although they didn't say that. So I did. I went out there and Industrial Light and Magic at that time was in a rented warehouse in Van Nuys, California, which coincidentally happened to be about a six minute drive from where I grew up. So I knew exactly where it was. I went out there and uh, waited to meet with George while there were lots of people sitting at long tables assembling TIE fighters and X-wing fighters, although they weren't called that at the time. At least I didn't call them that out of hundreds of old Ravel model kits, World War II battleships and fighters and bombers and such. Uh, I was then uh, beckoned over to a side by a gentleman I didn't know who said, come here, I want to show you something really cool. Uh, this is the first computer-controlled camera in the history of motion pictures. Hmm. And of course, being young and stupid and not being aware of possible historical precedents at the time, I pretty much ignored John Dykstra while he spent 10 minutes trying to explain the, work, the workings of the Dykstra Flex camera to me. I kind of wish I could have gone. Yeah, I know. kind of wish I could have gone back and done that. Oh, my God. And then George came out and kind of showed me around. They were doing some green screen shots of an X-Wing fighter. And he said, you know, here's the Death Star, which is this beach ball sized plastic thing. And we just had a nice chat. I'm surprised, frankly particularly in retrospect, that he had any time for me at all, given the pressure he was under to deliver the film. But he did, and we got along, as far as I know, fine. And I then went back, and we signed a contract for me to do the book version of the film, and a sequel book, which became Splinter of the Mind's Eye. And that's how the whole thing came about from the get-go. So uh, regarding that sort of initial meeting, do you recall, um, and maybe sort of going into when they started uh, reviewing what you were sending in at all, do you remember 
what was the sort of tone of any creative direction at the time, like fr- like from Lucas, from his office? Uh, there was no creative direction. Everybody was totally absorbed in making the movie. And it was basically, here's a script. Here's some pre-production paintings by this guy, Ralph McQuarrie. Go write the book, which is what I did. Uh, never had to talk to anybody about it. Never had any input from anybody. As I said, everybody was really busy trying to finish the film. And then before the book was published, I went ahead and wrote Splinter of the Mind's Eye. I did get a little direction on that because after I turned the manuscript in, uh, George said, the book's fine. I need you to take two things out. The second thing I don't remember. The first thing was, for those of you who have read the book, or even those of you who haven't, The book actually started with a complete chapter, which was basically a very complex battle in space above the planet that Luke and Leia are forced down upon, which is why they're forced down there. And George said, you take this out. And I said, why? And he said, it would be too expensive to film. Because you have to remember that Splinter of the Mind's Eye was done with the idea that if Star Wars was neither a big success nor a big failure, George could make a low-budget sequel, utilizing as many of the props and costumes and backgrounds and such from the first film, no CGI in those days, as possible. And I had to write the book with that in mind, although I kind of let it get away from me in chapter one, designing this big space battle. So we took that out, and Splinter of the Mind's Eye essentially starts with chapter two. That sort of ties into something I wanted to ask you about, and maybe there's no answer to this based on how long ago this was, but there's there's some parts in the book that sort of develop in Splinter of the Mind's Eye that sort of develops Luke's relationship with the now deceased Obi-Wan. And I'm just guessing at the type of things that Lucas might have cared to expand upon or or give you some information about beforehand, that might be one of them. Do you remember if there was ever any conversations about that? Absolutely nothing, insofar as I can remember. Nobody said anything about anything. It was, as I said, everybody involved with the film was totally involved with the film. The book, although it was important, obviously, to generate hopeful buzz for the forthcoming film, was an ancillary project, Uh, was not directly related to the film in the sense that there was any back and forth between myself and George or Gary Kurtz or Charlie Lippincott or anybody else. Nobody had time. So it was my job to take the screenplay, the few pre-production paintings, and write a book. As far as Splinter goes, it was essentially the same thing. The only instructions I was given with regard to Splinter was just make sure it's filmable on a low budget. That's why it's set on a frog, fog-shrouded planet, and a lot of it takes place underground, uh, reduces the cost of... Uh, of shooting and and background construction and uh, uh, it was basically I was off by myself doing these two books. I wish I could say that uh, on December third, nineteen seventy four, Gary Kurtz called me and said we're thinking of doing this with the character of Obi Wan in the next twenty three films. Please put it in the book. That nothing like that ever happened. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Zach or Rob, did you, do you want to add anything about Splinter? I have one question, and it kind of comes to the idea that, like you said, everybody knows it's part of Splinter's uh, legend and lore is that it would have been the sequel if Star Wars was a disappointment. But as we all know, cultural history, Star Wars blew up in more ways than Aang could ever foresee. Were you ever disappointed in the way that the fact that like Splinter didn't have the opportunity to become a major motion picture? Sure, who wouldn't be? I mean, I'm as much a fan of I'm as much a fan as anybody else. I think that's one reason why people like my my book adaptations of film screenplays. It's because they're written by a combination of an experienced writer and a 14-year-old kid sitting in the back of the theater criticizing the lousy special effects with his friends. <laughs> With that, with that in mind, I'm sure people email you about this stuff. Do you have somebody who lets you know every time that something you sort of might have given a name to in those first two books, like shows up years down the line? For example, Man Band showing up in the solo movie. Like, do you, do you enjoy when they do this? Do you, how do you feel about stuff like that? You have to understand, I'm sure you understand, a novelization is a work for hire. 
It's just like hiring somebody to paint your house. Uh, you as a painter may think that a, a light sandstone color with maybe a little uh, darker orange trim might go well, and the owner might come to you and say, I want purple with pink polka dots. And you either paint the house purple with pink polka dots or you don't take the job. And once you've done the job, it's done, you get paid, that's generally it. So if somebody, if somebody uses something that they've already contracted and paid for in a future film, uh, and as you suggest, yes, fans do notify me all the time, not just for the movie novelizations, but for my own original work too, if somebody quote unquote uses something from it. Uh, the internet is very useful for that. I can have somebody in Bulgaria say, hey, they're making a film of your story such and such. Do you have any interest in it? So I can go from there. But uh, no, I'm, I'm happy if they do that. I was delighted to see Mimban mentioned. That was, you know, that's a wonderful callback. I got paid for that book. I still get paid for that book <laughs> after a little bit of a chat with Disney, which you're probably all familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> the Wikipedia page was updated to say that it was resolved. <laughs> it was resolved. The issues with uh, the issues involved Star Wars, the novelization, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and the novelizations of the first three Alien films. Because, of course, when Disney bought Fox, they acquired Alien properties. It's all been resolved at my end. I know that there are other people, um, from what I see lately, who have not had their issues quite resolved. But as far as I'm concerned, everything is copacetic between me and Disney accounting. People need to understand that I have, I love Disney. I have no quibble with Disney product per se. I, I've been an animation collector for a long time and I'm delighted in what Disney does. But Disney creative and Disney accounting are like the light and dark side of the moon. One always <laughs> operates in darkness and the other always operates in the light. Uh, I'm real happy to uh, to chat with people from the light side. The dark side is why the dark side, no pun intended, is why you have agents and lawyers and uh, but no, everything with me and Disney is resolved. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Before we we move past the those first two books, I think it's really sort of important to stress to the listeners who are maybe not part of that sort of original generation of Star Wars fans to really understand that, like, before VHS, you didn't have any way to rewatch these movies. And these two books meant so much to that first crop of Star Wars fans who desperately wanted to get back in there. Maybe it was still in theaters because it was in theaters for a long time, but their parents weren't about to take them back two or three times. And, uh, you know, that book really provided a sort of a window to sort of get back into that story. And I think it sold, I'm sh sold something like three and a half million copies, like from six months ahead of the film's release up to when the movie came out, which is just crazy. And like, I know later releases had great production stills inside them. And I, I, I wasn't really around for that sort of initial run of it, but like I knew I was a Star Wars fan before the prequels came out and I had a, a copy of this book and I what I really enjoyed about it was as it was hard for me to sort of get into uh, other fantasy books like the Tolkien stuff before the movies came out just because there's a lot of terminology in there where no you don't really know how to visualize it, especially as a young kid in my experience. And that Star Wars book was great because anywhere I picked it up, if I put it down for a couple of days, I always knew what was going on and it always had something a little more and interesting to add to what we saw on screen. So just want to, since I have the opportunity to say thanks so much for that, it was a great gift as a young reader. You're welcome. The great thing about writing books like Splinter the Mind's Eye or even doing novelizations, depending on whether or not the studio decides to mess with the writer or not, is that you, as the writer, get to make your own director's cut as far as the novelizations are concerned, and hopefully they leave your changes alone. And when you do a sequel book uh, or a book related to the book, for example, uh, I did an original novel set between the first and second Transformers film where I got to essentially write my own Transformers story. And that's, that's a great deal of fun. Who, what fan wouldn't want to do that? The fans do it anyway. I just, the difference is I get paid for it. We do want to eventually sort of um, get back to sort of what your experience was like working with Lucasfilm at sort of its big different stages throughout the years. But j just just since you since you brought up the, the Transformers book, I, I sort of want to um, 
I think Al- the Alien trilogy is sort of a good uh, example for um, something to build off what you just said about sort of making your own director's cut. At least those three books were like, although those movies are like six and seven years apart, which is dream for direct sequels. When you're p- putting those together, do you sort of do you ever put in anything for the fans who are following along the novelizations in the same sense? Like, is there any callbacks to stuff that you added in the Alien book in Aliens or Alien 3 that's just sort of there for those who are paying attention? Like, are you viewing it as sequels to the novel as much as it is a novelization of the next film? I hear what you're saying. I When I do a sequel, I, I view it as a continuation of the original story. And I do try to put stuff like that in there. I can't give you, for the Alien films and books, uh, a specific example right off the top of my head. There are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of fans who can do that. But for example, all three of the first three Alien books open in a similar fashion, talking about dreams and the characters as dreamers. That was an intentional thing, obviously, by me, to try and make a callback, as you said, to the previous books. I always view anything like that as a continuous story, and it should be a continuous story. I ended up doing the novelization of Alien Covenant as well, although I did not do Alien Resurrection uh, for reasons which I'm happy to explain, but have been talked about before. But I view all of that as a continuous story, even if I don't agree with the direction that the writers and the direct and Ridley Scott are taking. If I were doing all of those books, I would it would behoove me to be consistent. Uh, If I was doing the novelization of Prometheus, for example, I understand one was done, but it was only published in Japan, which is a weirdity that nobody can seem to figure out to this day. But if I were doing that novelization, I would make sure to include something in that novelization that accorded back to the first three or four alien books. Unfortunately, it's rare that a studio allows the same writer to do that sort of thing. I thought it was unusual that I ended up doing the novelization of the first three Alien books. So just building on that a little bit, so like I use the Alien books as an example just because although they were sort of far apart, it wasn't an insane amount of time. For example, like you, uh, early in your career, you did some adaptations of Star Trek, the animated series, and then you ended up doing the novelizations for the two J.J. Abrams movies, the first two. I'm, I'm guessing those are completely different experiences, and there's so much time in between them, but something makes me wonder, like, when you're writing Kirk or Spock dialogue, is the ex- experience of doing that the same as if it's the same character in your mind? You know what I mean? Oh, Absolutely. And it doesn't seem to fade. You know, I get asked all the time, I say, well, you, you ended up doing novelization of Young Kirk and, and Young Spock, and it was many, many years after you wrote the story for the film and the Star Trek log novelizations and the talking records for Peter Pan Records, if anybody remembers those, the seven original stories with the dialogue and sound effects. Uh, and it was as if no time had passed at all. I don't know if that's just me or if every writer who does uh, this sort of project feels the same way. But when I started writing Kirk and Spock again, the characters were right there. Uh, I could see them. I could hear them. And it was as if no time had passed at all. I think fans appreciate that, too. That is the answer I wanted to hear, but was not expecting to hear, which is great. <laughs> so that's awesome. So, so I guess um, uh, from there we 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 would like to sort of move into the the next chapter of you sort of working with Lucasfilm down the road when you did the one sort of prequel era novel that you were involved with was the Approaching Storm. Could you sort of articulate for us how was this initial conversations different? They were sort of knee deep and getting the prequels done at that time. So I think it'd be so interesting to hear the contrast from the last time you dealt with Lucasfilm. All right. Well, you've all heard the first time I dealt with Lucasfilm. Uh, Go write the books, take out the first chapter of Splinter. That was about it. By the time I wrote The Approaching Storm, I'd already been asked uh, by Valentine Books to do spin-off books over and over again, you know, Chewbacca's uncle's third cousin kind of thing. And I just didn't want to do that. <laughs> it just didn't interest me. And so I passed on them, even though there was a fair amount of money involved. I just, I just didn't interest me. I, I couldn't see a way to do it. 
And then they came along and said, well, we're doing two books. Uh, this is from Ballantyne Del Rey books. We're going to do two books which are set between episodes one and two. And they will actually be part of, they didn't say canon, but they said they will be part of the storyline. We would like you to do one. And I said, well, you know, send me what you have in mind as far as information to begin with. And lo and behold, I was introduced to a female Jedi, which was a brand new concept, at least to me anyway, and her uh, Padawan, who was also female. And there was actually a line from the film, first film, about a problem on a planet called Anison. And that was it. That was essentially that Obi-Wan and uh, Anakin have to go and try to solve. That was what I was given. I thought, well, this actually could be interesting. This is not something that takes place in a different solar system that has nothing to do with the Star Wars basic lineage, the main line. I think I can make something interesting out of this and have fun. So I agreed to do it. And I then drew up an outline. And instead of being told, as I was with Star Wars, the first two books, go and write the books, it was like you need to come up to the ranch and we need to have a, uh, a sit down with the story group. And that was the first I'd heard that Star Wars now had a story group. So I went up there and there was a lot of discussion, um, all very pleasant and tactful, of course, um, some of which I agreed with, some of which I didn't agree with, but it was a lot more of a uh, a joint project at that point than just go write the books, which is what a writer wants to hear. Nonetheless, uh, I dealt with it. I went back, I wrote what I thought was a pretty good book. I wrote the whole book basically so I could do one scene, I'll let you guys try to guess which that scene is. And I thought I turned out a pretty good Star Wars book that fits neatly between episodes one and two. That's how the approaching storm happened. The meetings you had with the story group, how much of that is their interest in sort of getting you up to speed with the state of the galaxy at that time? Like how much of that was on you or did they sort of paint the picture of like where like the geopolitical state of the Star Wars galaxy at that time? It wasn't so, it wasn't so much that as uh, things related to specific characters. Uh, and again, I can't remember specific examples. It was a long time ago. But it was more along the lines of, well, we don't think um, we don't think Anakin would do this in regards to something that I had suggested in the outline. Uh, they didn't say we think he should do this or we think he's more like that. It was more along the lines of, you know, do something else, but don't do this. So it was much more character. They were much more concerned, as I re as I remember, about getting the characters straight, obviously, because they were planning more films than it was about any geopolitical background or anything like that. Uh, changes like that are easy to make. Changes in character, because they run through the entire story, are much more problematical and require a lot more time to deal with. So it was a fair, there were a couple of fairly intensive sessions there. Nobody yelled at anybody else. I'm not a yeller. Um, I'm, I, I don't have the ego where I'm going to stand up and say, well, this is the greatest book. This is going to be the greatest book since War and Peace. And you can't change the <laughs> work. There are writers like that. But again, if you're going to do that, you shouldn't take this kind of work. You shouldn't take these jobs. I will make my points known, and I will justify every single one of them, which I've done with numerous books. But in the end, when it's not your own original book, you have to do what the people in control of the property want you to do. So I'm guessing since that story, the bones of that story that they pitched you appealed to you more so compared to the other expanded universe concepts they were trying to get you to do earlier on. I would take it that your response to seeing episode one was sort of favorable. I mean, just so you know, between between us here, we're pretty much prequel fans, but we're, of course, we're no stranger to uh, those who are criti right, fully critical about certain aspects of it. Well, I enjoyed some of it, and I would have done some things differently. But probably if you took any audience, uh, you, that's exactly the reaction you get from most people. Because, you know, well, I like this, but I would have changed this, or I would have done this differently, or uh, I, I'm not going to get into specifics because you'd end up with an entirely different film. 
And I don't believe in criticizing films, you know, years and years after they've come out. That's that's like going back to the 1927 version of Moby Dick that starred John Barrymore Sr., where uh, Ahab ends up killing the whale because his girlfriend doesn't think he's a whole man because he's missing a leg. And he goes back to Nantucket and they live happily ever after, uh, which is a little <laughs> different from what Melville did. Uh, you, you have to deal with that sometimes uh, in Hollywood. And I, I don't believe in doing that. I, when I feel strongly, really strongly about something, I will make my position known, as I have with uh, certain Star Wars films. That sounded like a great opening for you, Zach. You got anything to, to go with there? Um, actually, I have a multitude of questions just about this era of Lucasfilm. Um, Mr. Foster, during that time period, you've talked about in other interviews where you're given like snippets of film, even going back to when you did uh, the original Star Wars novelization. You had some Macquarie artwork for the prequel novel. Did you, What sort of uh, reference quality did you have or uh, reference material, excuse me, um, considering that Attack of the Clones was – on the horizon in that regard. Did you have any idea of what Anakin would look like when he was no longer a child or what the next stage of Obi-Wan Kenobi was going to be? What I had was I had excellent uh, renderings of what Barris Ophi uh, and uh, Luminara Unduli would look like, which is, you know, and uh, that was about it. I didn't even have a, a description of what the planet Anison should be like. They left, they left all of that up to me. So I designed Anison as basically uh, a planetary version of the Great Plains with roving bands of, of uh, indigenous people. And none of that came from Lucasfilm. I had to invent all that. That's why they do that sort of thing. They're busy with the films. As far as characters who went on from episode one to episode two and so on, like Anakin and Obi-Wan, uh, um, I actually don't recall. I didn't have any photographs. I didn't have any stills from the film, for example. It wasn't like with the Star Trek novelizations where with the first one I had all kinds of photographs from the sets and, you know, descriptions of instrumentation in the ship. And for the second one, they actually sent me the film in pieces. So I was able, that's the way to do it. Uh, obviously, it couldn't be done in early times, but put the film up on one side of your screen and you've got your manuscript on the other and you can stop it and run it backwards and forwards and but that requires CIA level security. <laughs> but that was a great way. That was the easiest, the easiest novelization I had to do in terms of getting everything correct because I could just watch the rough. It was a rough cut, the rough cut of the film. But as far as the approaching storm goes, and I didn't have much, but I did know what the main characters looked like. Hmm. Would you have to have like a timetable of when you worked on that? Because we know, obviously, when it came to the original Star Wars, this was years before the film was released. With that, I would imagine it was sometime the year 2000, give or take. For the approaching storm? Mm -hmm. Oh, I couldn't I couldn't tell you. I couldn't remember. But I always want these books instantly. There's this <laughs> chronological disconnect between the publishing industry and the motion picture industry. The motion picture industry, they spend two, three years on a film, and then when they start handing out ancillary rights, as opposed to the original Star Wars, obviously, but typically the film is just about ready to uh, be finished, and then they sell the book rights and they want a novelization to come out. Well, that's fine, except that publishing, at least if you're going to do a print book and not just publish online, uh, you have to set everything up in type. It has to well, you have set everything up on the computer. You have to, uh, everything has to be proofed and copy edited, has to be printed, cover has to be designed, uh, book has to be bound, book has to be shipped, and the studio would like this to happen two days after the film comes out, which is fine unless they sell the rights three months before the film is supposed to come out. And it just drives publishers nuts. I went through this on the book version of uh, Terminator Salvation where they kept changing everything in the film, for those of you familiar with the film, over and over and over again. And I would keep going, but I would keep getting updates from Titan, from the publisher in Britain, saying they've just added this and changed this and taken this out. Could you possibly put that in the book? And I would go back into the manuscript that I had already finished these parts regarding and do that. And just before uh, they were supposed to, I don't want to say go to press, that's an ancient term, I got a letter saying they've made a few more changes. Can you look at them and see if you can do anything? And they had changed the entire film, basically. I mean, wow. Basically, 
components of the film changed at the last minute. And I had already been paid. That's how late in the process this was. I'd already gotten my check. My manuscript had already been accepted. I didn't have to do anything with that book. But my name is on the cover. And I have a responsibility to the reader. And so mm -hmm. I went back over a weekend and basically rewrote the book wow. to incorporate all of these changes. I'm not sure it made a whole lot of difference. But when I do a novelization, one thing I... I always do is try to make what I have, the materials I have, accord as much as possible to the version of the film that I've either seen or read in script form as possible. I don't have to do that. When I've satisfied my, my requirements, uh, I can walk away and do something else. But as a writer and as a fan, I just can't do that. I just, I won't do that to the fans. Fascinating. Well, actually, um, not to jump too far ahead, but I have some questions about the next era of Lucasfilm you'd be working in, The Force Awakens. And um, on this podcast, obviously, it was started in 2017 in the the burgeoning era of uh, Disney Star Wars films. And obviously, you did The Force Awakens novelization. And on the commentary for the film, J.J. Abrams admits that he reshot a lot of the film after principal photography. And it kind of goes into what you were saying with Terminator Salvation. Were those were there similar issues with The Force Awakens um, in that regard of where things were changed? And just if you wouldn't mind elaborating further on this third era of working with Lucasfilm. Uh, no, I, I did the manuscript. I turned it in. They asked for some things to be taken out. I argued as vociferously as I ever argue about those things. But it wasn't a case of reshoots on J.J.'s part, coming back to haunt the manuscript that had already been done, because the publisher had a deadline. Mm. Uh, there was only so much that could be retrofitted into the manuscript of the book based on reshoots. And I didn't really have any uh, encounter any big problems with that. What problems I had with The Force Awakens were things they made me take out, which were not major, but they were, I thought, writerly things that would have improved the story. I understand why they made me take them out from their point of view. From my point of view, I thought the book would have been better with them in. What's funny is the main thing I thought they would take out was, uh, and this has been talked about before by other people, so I don't feel bad about talking about it. The super weapon in The Force Awakens is really stupid. <laughs> there's no other there's no other way to describe it if you have enough energy to draw down a piece of the local star then you don't need to draw down a piece of the local star you already have enough energy to do whatever you want if you do draw down a piece of the local star the heat and energy that would come down would immediately blow all of the atmosphere off the planet and everybody on it would die including all the plants and i could go on and on about it i i'm very proud of trying to fix as much of the science in the novelizations of these films as they will let me do. Sometimes they leave me alone completely, and sometimes I get hassled over it. But I thought, I can't do this. This has to be fixed. So I did more research on how to blow up a planet than I would normally do for any tiny, specific, small part of a novelization, just because I wanted to. I wanted to be able to do something that if uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson read the book, for example, he wouldn't throw it in the fireplace or <laughs> you know, scream several clever imprecations towards me. Uh, I just, I had to fix it. So there's basically two pages in The Force Awakens of nothing but really advanced, and I don't pretend to understand any of the math or anything, but really advanced astrophysics and general physics involving dark matter and something called quintessence and using gravitons as a way to explode the core of a planet that I thought, when I put it all together, uh, at least could not be laughed at. Let's put it that way. And I thought, sure, they would take it out. That they left in. Mm. And I think there are two reasons for that. Nobody wanted to admit they didn't understand what it was. Because <laughs> that's Hollywood. And sorry, I didn't understand it either, but I could fake it better. And, <laughs> um, there, there was no reason to, so they, they left that in. By the way, I wrote an eight-page, excuse me, a four-page summary of why I made that specific change and tried to get it, I gave it to somebody at the Star Wars 
a festival or get together in Orange County. Star Wars Celebration? Yes. Gave it to somebody from the studio or from Lucasfilm, I forget which, and said, can you please get this to J.J. Abrams? And as far as I know, he never saw it. Uh, maybe the CGI was all done already. I don't know. So that they left in. Simpler stuff they made me take out. So it wasn't a bad experience, but uh, it wasn't a go write the book and the book is fine when I turned it in experience either. So it's so great to hear you talk about the importance you're placing on scientific accuracy, at least within a realm of acceptability. This is something I'm so tired of hearing about when I call it out and people are like, Star Wars is space fantasy. We don't need to think about these sort of things. There's an, <laughs> there's, you know, there's another moment in The Force Awakens that I, I'm just curious if you remember your initial take on it. And this is something that maybe there's something wrong with me, but this just yanked me out of my seat when I saw this movie in theaters. And that's when um, Ray observes with the naked eye five or six planets being destroyed in different systems through the daylight atmosphere of the, a planet. <laughs> do you rec do you recall remembering your first, first seeing that scene or like anything about how you handled it? How could I forget? Um, if you, if you will recall the almost the exact same scene plays out in Star Trek into darkness where Spock is stuck on this icy moon and looks up to see Vulcan destroyed you know, that is very close. I, I do at least give it a pass for being in the same solar system. Okay, still. <laughs> Look, Star Wars is science fantasy. That doesn't mean we completely ignore all science throughout the universe forever if there is a way to fix it. Now, certain things are just grandfathered into Star Wars. Lightsabers, which is a completely impractical weapon because you're more likely to cut your own foot off than, than dispatch your opponent. Um small starships that you can cross light years in a matter of a minute or two uh, with no obvious fuel source, things like that. They're all grandfathered in and we just accept them. But if it's not grandfathered in, if it's something new, and if I can do something about it, then by golly, I will at least try to do it. There are other examples I could give you. And it's, this is not just a, an issue with Star Wars. It's an issue with every science fiction film, basically, that, that comes out of Hollywood. Uh, the biggest problem they have is that they don't seem to realize that space is really big. I mean, it's really big, uh, referencing your comment about seeing other planets destroyed. By the way, in addition to designing something that I thought could at least pass muster, muster with a physicist as far as blowing up a planet, I had to figure out a way how to do it instantaneously in real time, essentially, from one solar system to another one many light years away. So I just kind of stuck in there the concept about how you fold space time and the weapon has enough power to do that. So it goes from point A to point B, essentially like two points on a piece of paper that you fold together. Otherwise, there's no way of explaining that. I didn't go into the physics of that because my brain was tired at that point. Yeah, wouldn't we absolutely appreciate that kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't know about everybody else uh, uh, with us tonight, but myself, like I... I uh, do make a habit of binging, broadly speaking, astronomy related podcasts as well. And, you know, for those of you who uh, pay attention to that kind of stuff, there is a there is a recent story uh, about a, a Kepler discovered star KIC 8462, which has demonstrated a secular dimming over the last hundred years and has a large object on a 1500 day uh, orbit that dims the star 20%. So, you know, when you ought to appreciate stuff, like when you sort of put research into like how a, a battle station could siphon energy off of a star, because it's one of the outlandish theories being floated around right now about what's causing something that scientists are currently observing in September of 2021. So the bottom line is some preposterous star killer base could be out there. At least you have a basis for rationalizing something. You just don't pull it out of whole cloth, like rubbing a magic lamp and the genie pops out and does everything. Yeah, I mean, there's actual scientists out there putting papers together that explain how a super advanced civilization might siphon energy off of a star. It's it, it's it's out there if you look for it. And I think it's great that you're sort of putting that kind of effort into these topics. Oh, you try, but you can only throw things like dice and spheres out there so much because you're basically in the end, you're dealing with a general audience. You're not dealing with a, a, a science fiction audience. 
You're trying to appeal as many people as possible. And if you start talking about stuff like that too much in a film, people's eyes will glaze over. And I understand this problem. It's why you blow things up. If you think about it logically, it's kind of stupid to blow up a habitable planet. We don't know how many of them there are. And why would you do that? Uh, there, there are other ways to take over a planetary civilization without blowing the whole thing up. One would think that habitable planets would be considered somewhat valuable. I, I remember my favorite science fiction writer of all time was a British writer named Eric Frank Russell. And I actually got to collaborate with him posthumously on a book called Design for Great Day, which was a, a novella that I expanded into a full novel for tour books. And you have this super civilization in our galaxy, which is actually even capable of intergalactic travel. And there's a war in this other galaxy between these two civilizations. And before the war starts, there's another hostile expansionist group. And our group goes and says, don't, don't do this anymore. It's not nice. And bad things happen. And then this civilization goes and they don't kill anybody. What they do is they, and the method isn't described, they render infertile all the females on this planet. And what happens is this hostile civilization who can't solve this problem just dies out. And they win the war, you know, the war essentially, it doesn't happen. They defeat the enemy by denying life to the unborn. And I thought, well, what an elegant way to win a war. Nobody is killed. They just... They basically exterminate the population without touching anybody. Uh, it, well, anyway, I digress. But you can't do that in a movie because it would be a really undramatic. Um, you'd never get John Wick 4, let's put it that way. Your, your point is well taken, but sort of in if you look at the scope of the Star Wars movies in the current canonical chronological order, you know, the Empire Destroying Alderaan, it, we'll give them that. It sort of makes sense as a political statement at the time in, the, in which the story takes place. It did seem like a little bit heavy handed, numerous other planet destructions after the fact. So I, 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 I get why I love the idea that it's like the portrayal of the Empire, especially in the current uh, Disney era on stuff like um, the Bad Batch, for example, it seems like it there's, in my opinion, there's almost a cartoonish, heavy handed level of disregard and destruction from the empire to the point where it's hard to view them as like that they would ever get anything done from my perspective you know so it's i think they can cross a line there too yeah i mean if you can't handle one guy in a fighter who goes up pops up in front of your entire fleet and makes a phone call i don't know how he has you know what i'm talking about oh yes we, we all remember that scene very well where the extra rocket booster on the back causes BB-8's head to fly backwards and all that good stuff. Oh, yeah, it's just, it's just kind of on and on like that. It's, um... I guess a follow-up to, again, getting back to the Force Awakens novelization, was it like, you mentioned obviously when it came to doing that, the story group was probably involved with your novelization of the force awakens was it any more strict considering now that disney was the parent company and it wasn't being run by, by a sole proprietor george lucas i would say yes although the difference between uh, the supervision on the approaching storm versus the supervision on the force awakens um, I, they weren't all that dissimilar there were a lot of the same concerns on the part of the story group uh, with the Force Awakens, you have a film that's at issue and uh, approaching storm. So yeah, I mean there wasn't any hostility involved, but basically there there was a certain amount of look. This is the way it's going to be. We don't have to explain it to you. Whereas with the approaching storm, whenever a point was argued, uh, I got much more of an explanation as to why they wanted to change. Uh, that's to be expected as. As the franchise got bigger and bigger, um, there's a lot. You know, there's an enormous amount of money at stake, and uh, reputations are at stake, and jobs are at stake. Much more so with the Force Awakens than uh, with the approaching storm, and I understand that. Uh, but part of the problem is, as I've, I've said every time I talk to anybody, basically, is uh, people in the motion picture business, and this is true all over the world, not just in Hollywood who go into the motion picture business, you know, they know basically that they can't, they can't build the sets, they can't do the CGI, 
They can't direct, they can't produce, they can't act, they can't run the cameras, they can't do the sound, but everybody thinks they can write. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. When you come up with something like, uh, uh, well, a novelization of somebody else's property, and you have to be prepared to defend your position, and if your defense doesn't carry the day, you have to be prepared uh, to just let it drop. And I'm always prepared to do that, but I always because of the nature of the beast. But I will also defend my position. I'll give you an example uh, from The Force Awakens. You remember the scene where Han Solo is finally back in the Millennium Falcon, and Ray and everybody is back on there with him. And, of course. And Han can't get it started, essentially. And Ray gets it going, and he looks mm -hmm. over and says, if I remember correctly, good job. Do you all remember that? Of course. Okay. I then had in the book, after Han says to Ray, good job, I had him say, don't get cocky, kid. <laughs> For the obvious reason, call back to the very first film. I thought that would be completely in character with Han and a perfectly logical thing for him to say. And they had me take that out. Why? <laughs> that's that's the thing I find kind of inexplicable with with not just Lucasfilm but the Walt Disney Company. And I've heard you tell this story before, and that's where I, I'm so glad you brought it up here. Is that notion is like, do you feel they excluded that because it was infringing on? what they want to do with Ray, because we, as we all know the force awakens is so uh, beholden to the original trilogy. That seems like, like you said, a perfect just shoe in for nostalgia. Do you have a specific idea as to why, just even if it is a uh, conjecture as to why they, they were so against that? Um, I, I honestly don't know. That wasn't one of the things that they had me take out that was really explained. Uh, somebody probably thought that maybe they thought it wasn't in character for Han at that point. Maybe they thought that they didn't want to call back to the first film. Uh, maybe they didn't want to make any kind of connection, however tenuous, between Luke and Ray, although there's one there. Um, oh, yeah. Hardly tenuous. So <laughs> I, I didn't understand. And I know certain things. I, I know certain things with 100% confidence don't know everything with 100% confidence, but I know if Han had spoken, if, if Harrison Ford had spoken that line at that moment in the theater, there would have been a cheer from the audience. I know oh, that. Without a doubt. I know that. But it's not there in the film. It's not there in the book. It's like you do the best you can as a writer and a fan. At the end of uh, uh, Star Trek, the novelization, you remember there's a sequence in there. This is the reboot. JJ's film, where Scotty talks about experimenting with the transporter. The Admiral's pet beagle gets in there and disappears permanently. I wanted, I actually wrote this scene out. After the end credits of the film, we have a shot of the transporter room. The transporter activates, and this very disturbed beagle comes wandering out. No dialogue, would have been a cinch to do, but you know, this this is the sort of thing that breaks writers in the motion picture business is you knock yourself out to come up with what you think is good, clever stuff, and it just gets shot down mm -hmm. and there's no particular explanation for it. Um, you try it on other people and they say, yeah, we think it's great. Whether they're being honest or not, you never really know. But what I discovered was I love movies. I've always loved movies, but I don't love the movie business. <laughs> And people say, well, why don't you why don't you go make your own movie then, like Robert Rodriguez for $25,000? And it just, I, I had other responsibilities. I didn't have enough drive. So all I can do is make suggestions uh, in films that I'm in contact with. Since you since you brought up the uh, the transporter, even though you're talking about the J.J. Uh, movie, I, I got to ask, is the striking scene in star trek the motion picture where the transporter accident occurs and there's that classic line where what we got back wasn't really human or so they say something like that was that you or did they add that in after the fact no that was as i recall that was in the script okay it's a little bit of a 
rough tonal shift for where they are at that point in the movie and it's probably more horrific than like anything else that's in star trek so i just it stood out to me as a a very interesting moment and uh, i mean i i think that sort of series of six films is like probably the best star trek content i know that's a hot take for a lot of tng fans out there that first movie maybe you could give us a little bit sort of about the broad plot of this lost probe that becomes like a super artificial intelligence was that in a story outline you were working on could you tell us a little bit about that uh roddenberry gave me a two-page synopsis called robots return this is all in the official history of star trek and said see if you can make something of this now this is when they were in the process of trying to revive the tv show i was supposed to develop that into an hour-long uh synopsis suitable for an hour-long script, screenplay. Uh, they then decided they were going to revive the series with a two-hour movie for TV to open it. That synopsis that I had done was selected to be expanded. I then expanded it to carry two hours instead of one hour, and it then became the basis for the film. As far as the film goes, once it became a big-budget film, I became an instant non-person. Uh, another reason that, um, why I have such love for the movie business. But okay, that's the way the business works. And I went off and did other things. Uh, The first five minutes of that film is all mine. That's exactly the way I laid it out in the synopsis, in the treatment, uh, as it's called. And there were a few other things in there that were retained uh, from my treatment. They changed the name uh, to V'ger. All of that was fine. I made Kirk an admiral. I thought enough time had passed. there's a, a reference to a Japanese World War II battleship that I slipped in there called the Congo. It's so much fun to be a fan, um, especially when the people that you're submitting this stuff to have no idea what you're talking about. And um, But uh, it was all changed after that, the process of changing it. Um, you can read about, fans can read about in many, many places. There are some very good detailed descriptions of what happened. But it was not a pleasant experience for me and literally precipitated our move from California to Arizona. And uh, I'll tell you how bad it was. Is We were invited to the premiere at the Smithsonian Institution, premiere of the film. Uh, Paramount was going to pay for everything. Um, and we didn't go because I discussed it with my wife and she said, we'll do whatever you want to do. And I thought about it and knowing what what kind of effort goes into a big budget film like that and how many people had worked on it really hard, uh, the crafts people, the actors. Uh, I didn't want to rain on anybody's parade, so we didn't go. I, I'm sorry to hear you didn't have a great experience with that one. I, I have read a little bit about it myself. And, you know, I just uh, to me, in retrospect, that movie just sort of stands out because it's almost separate from the other five in terms of those five sort of feel like episodic in a way they're sort of going one to the other and they're totally more similar. And and there's reasons for that, of course, they're just based on the production of the first movie. But I know there's a there's probably a few uh, listeners out there in the Knights of Vader audience who are sleeping on how interesting the Star Trek motion picture franchise is. And you should probably get into that. PSA over. (laughs) <laughs> Can you imagine going into a, a major studio now and saying, look, I'd like to make a, um, what would cost today, I'd like to make a $150 million film about the next stage up in human evolution. Okay, there's a few ships get blown up at the beginning, and that's it as far as action goes, really. And they would just look at you like you were from another planet. It would never get made. And it's remarkable, I think, the most remarkable thing about the first Star Trek movie is that it did get made. And as you know, there was an enormous amount of pressure to get it finished by a certain date, which complicated the special effects no end, many of which had to be completely redone. And the problems just went on and on. People ask me all the time, what do I think of the finished film? I say, I think it's fine. I claim the first five minutes, as I've already mentioned. Uh, There were other things I might have done differently. But after reading about what everybody involved with that film went through, I'm actually kind of glad actually kind of glad that um, I got shut out afterwards. Of course, if they let you write the screenplay and 436 people don't jump on you and say, change this, change that, then it's a whole different experience. Um, Then you get something like, hopefully we will get with Dune. 
which they're already watching in Europe, doggone it. And we don't get to see here for another few weeks. Here, here. I totally uh, understand your perspective on that. Um, you know, Star Trek, the motion picture, one of the more original and fascinating ideas for a film's antagonist that you'll find anywhere. Check it out if you have never seen it for some odd reason. Um, so I had a couple other things I wanted to move on to. I don't know about um, with Rob and Zach, do you have any, anything you want to uh, get to on the same line of the Force Awakens and Star Trek stuff we've been talking about? Yeah, because I know obviously you want to delve into some of Mr. Foster's independent work. But just one last thing about um, Star Wars, at least from my perspective, is that obviously you've mentioned kind of the process you go through as a work for hire, working for a major corporation. But um, this is kind of a unique phenomenon that happened with the subsequent sequel trilogy films, more specifically The Rise of Skywalker. Um, I know I, in my research, Mr. Foster, that I know you have your own treatment of The Rise of Skywalker because you were, uh, to put it kindly – disillusioned with The Last Jedi. I think that's fair to say. Um, but one thing I noticed that, again, I don't know maybe if it's exclusively to Lucasfilm, but what they did with The Rise of Skywalker was they delayed the release of the novelization until pretty much the exact same time the film was being released on home video. And the novelization was tasked with filling in a lot of narrative gaps in the actual film itself. The return of Palpatine, a lot of stuff that just happened with Luke Skywalker, Leia, especially in the uh, passing of Carrie Fisher. I was just curious what your thoughts are on the idea that the novelization is being positioned not just simply as an adaptation of a feature film, but as a way of retroactively filling in plot holes to, the, to a film. Well, that's a good that's a good use for novelization. No question about it. I haven't read the book. But uh, that's an excellent use for novelization. One would hope you could do that. The problem is, and of course, when you start trying to retcon stuff, uh, everything you try to fix leads to more problems that need to be fixed. But, um, you know, hopefully, I, again, I didn't read the book, but hopefully it did that. Um, there's only so much you can fix in a book. And then you reach the point where what you're writing in the novelization, if that's the sort of project you're doing, uh, conflicts with what's on screen. And then you actually end up multiplying a problem instead of solving it. So hopefully the book, hopefully the book didn't do that. Hopefully it did what people wanted it to. I just felt that at that point, it, the original story out of The Force Awakens couldn't be saved anymore. There was just too much hand wavy and and um, things that just don't make sense in episode eight uh, for anything to be fixed. I tried, but a lot of people thought it was silly and I'm perfectly prepared to argue everything I did in that proposed treatment. Uh, but people got, well, he's making Ray into a droid. I got a lot of that. For those of you, those people who read that treatment online, well, I never made Ray into a droid. The whole point was Ray had, a, Ray had a serious illness. That's why she was left behind by her parents, and she could only be fixed quietly and privately, and the only way to fix her was to give her a prosthesis. So she's not a droid, she's not even part droid. She has an electronic prosthesis in her brain, which enables her to do certain things that are not explainable otherwise, like throw a bunch of rocks around at the end of the film. But people seem to pass on that and just go to, well, he's made her a droid. And then you get stupid jokes about her and C-3PO. And oh, geez. As a writer, I'm not making this up. As a writer, you just kind of throw up your hands and say, well, if people are not going to read and analyze what you actually said, uh, you're going to put their own agenda on it, then there's no point in going on discussing it. And I just dropped the whole thing. Of course, I didn't have to write that at all. I did that for the fans. Well, sure, Mr. Foster. And one thing, like, if, if all honesty, you could actually keep your powder dry. Um, we'd love to, if you are kind enough, we'd love to. I read that and I, I have so many questions, but I've deliberately like kind of partitioned that away from this discussion because I'd love to discuss with you your ideas about that, and especially your disillusionment with The Last Jedi. Um, this is something kind of a tease, maybe, if uh, the future is kind to Knights of Vader, because there are so many. As somebody who loved The Last Jedi, I would love to pick your brain because for years now, um, I've always wanted to have a conversation with someone who didn't like The Last Jedi that was able to articulate 
their uh, just frustration with it beyond just I didn't get what I wanted and just point sure. blank. Sure. I would love yeah. to have that conversation one day with you, though. But I would imagine Rob's been uh, very quiet. I can imagine he has a bunch of questions for you. Um, so, Rob, uh, anything you'd like to ask Mr. Foster? No, actually, this has been wildly fascinating. Uh, I think, you know, Mr. Foster, it shows that you are a, uh, a pro at giving these types of interviews. I feel like you've answered all of the questions I've had. Uh, through answering my co-host questions, which has been great. I guess, um, you know, while I have the floor, I would like to then use it to uh, ask a question that one of our co-hosts who could not be here uh, had for you, uh, from our co-host Joe. Um, He was interested in, if you had the chance to write any more novelizations, would you uh, jump at those projects? Depends on the project. Uh, Okay. Well, it depends entirely on the project, whether it's a sequel to an existing franchise or an entirely original, entirely original story. I, mean, I would be uh, it just depends on the property. The answer is, yes, yeah, sure. I get to make my own director's cut. And that's that's one major reason, you know, why I why I do these things. I do need to mention before we go that people who are interested in my take on the novelizations I've done, including many we haven't had time to talk about that it occurred to me that if I didn't get all this down somewhere and somebody didn't ask me a certain question, that that particular answer would be lost permanently. So I finally put it all in a book, which is called The Director Should Have Shot You. And it just came out earlier this year from Centipede Press. So if people want to know what my experience was working on the first Clash of the Titans or the Chronicles of Riddick, Krull or John Carpenter's The Thing, which has its own fandom. Uh, Mm. Everything I could remember is down in that book. Yeah, definitely. We'll link to that in the show notes. Anyone who wants to see more of that. Yeah, fantastic. So so before we wrap this up, Chris, uh, do you have any more questions for Mr. Foster? At the risk of alienating our other co-hosts, I'm I'm, I'm gonna do it anyway. (laughs) But, um, you you know, I love like the sort of big sci-fi concepts that would probably alienate most of the movie going audience, but it's the type of stuff that you probably get to play with a little more in your original novelizations where you have the space to sort of pad out those ideas, right? You try. Yeah, yeah. So for listeners who don't know, uh, Mr. Foster has, I'm going to safely say, dozens of books that take place in a shared universe where there's a galactic government called the commonwealth to my great shame i've only read ice rigger but i thought it was very fascinating it was in a period of my history 10 years ago where i would go to used bookstores and check out the sci-fi section and get anything that looked awesome and 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 that was one of those books and i and I, i was really i loved the sort of the survival aspect of it since researching for this call i've realized how expansive that universe has become what are your sort of personal beliefs around the state of our universe? I know you play a little bit with ancient alien artifacts in the in that series. Could you sort of articulate your worldview and how that informs the universe that exists with the Commonwealth books? Yeah, the universe in 20 words or less. Okay. Um, you can take more than that. <laughs> We're here for it. All right. Use two uh, senses, three if you have to. It's good to know. Um, <laughs> I'd always been fascinated by galactic civilizations that involve galactic stories going all the way back to Doc Smith because it gives you an opportunity to develop different environments and it gives you an opportunity to develop different cultures and particularly to deal with different aliens. I have a problem with Star Trek aliens, although that was a matter of budget more than anything else, that all are bipedal and bisymmetrical and have two eyes and two hands and five fingers on each hand. Uh, I mean, come on, even with a rubber suit, You don't have to do five fingers on each hand. They're all human-sized. And one of the reasons I did did the Commonwealth was so that I could do aliens that didn't look like people in rubber suits and then explore the cultures, not just have aliens who maybe looked really alien but acted just like people from Topeka. And uh, so I did that, bearing in mind the science that would allow something like galactic civilizations and empires and commonwealths to exist. And it requires doing things like 
creating something called space plus and something else called space minus, where certain laws of physics uh, don't apply or act differently. Otherwise, you can't have communications. Frank Herbert in Dune does it with spaceships that just essentially pop in one place and pop out somewhere else. Uh, that wasn't what principally interested Frank. He was interested in human society, how it develops and changes, uh, politics, uh, the environment. And I'm interested in those things too. But I'm also interested in starships and interstellar communication. And you can't do this with just within the solar system. You need to have uh, a greater expanse, if you will. And I started putting together after the first book, The Tar and Krang, that I wrote, um, the Commonwealth became something that was a convenient background for other stories like Ice Rigger. Ice Rigger, uh, by the way, that's a trilogy in case you didn't know that. Ice Rigger could have been set entirely independently from the Commonwealth. But I needed a system of starships, I needed a system of communications and government, and it was simpler just to use the existing one then develop an entirely new one, which is fortunate, because if I'd had to do that for each book that's set in the Commonwealth, and you end up with 50 or 60 different governments and, and uh, uh, transportation systems, it slows down the things that you really want to talk about. So that's how the Commonwealth came about, really, was as a background for other stories that I wanted to tell, some involving a character called Flinks, uh, some entirely separate, like the trilogy, the Ice Rigger trilogy, or standalone novels, like Nor Crystal Tears, which is about how the Commonwealth gets started. And within that larger framework of the Commonwealth, uh, I was able to do those stories. If people go to my website, even though it's all old uh, HTML stuff, there are interactive maps of the Commonwealth on there, and you can click on a planet and find out what the planet is like. Uh, a lot of work by some fans uh, went into that, and it probably should all be updated now, but at this point, it's like, good enough for what it is. We'll, we'll leave it at that. I have to say, I uh, definitely checked out the, your website with those maps, and they are really cool. I was blown away by the interactivity of them. I thought that was such a neat idea. Well, I'm glad you like it. It's old and it should be updated. And I, I talked to some people about updating it one time and they said, do you know how much information is on this website? Do you know what it would cost to completely update this? And I just, it wasn't practical. If somebody wanted to do it one day, they could go ahead and do it. But for me to pay tens of thousands of dollars just so you'd have a prettier map, uh, it's just not practical. The important thing is the information is there. I mean, the whole front... The whole Thranks alphabet, the Thranks being the principal aliens the humans ally with uh, within the Commonwealth, the whole Thranks alphabet is there because it was done by a fan in Italy. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. So you only so much time in the day. Totally, totally makes sense. And um, just to further alienate my uh, co-hosts, come on, like you, you, we don't get opportunities like this to ask one of the greatest science fiction authors ever silly questions like, what do you personally think about the Fermi paradox? Like, why do you think we don't see anything out there? Oh, boy. Well, better minds than mine have, have pondered on that. I think it's just it's a question of two things. It's a question of distance where you might have a developed civilization that has just sent out a signal that we could probably interpret, but it's 150 light years away and it's going to take a while to get here. Or they do reach a point uh, to where they can't manage a planetary civilization and they destroy themselves. That's a sad, depressing thought. But if you look at us, uh, we're not doing real well here. And we've, we've barely gotten some unmanned craft outside the solar system on any kind of travel. Uh, I don't know if that addresses the Fermi paradox directly. Now, people ask me, do, we, do I believe in aliens, intelligent aliens? And I say, yes. Yes, it's just uh, the numbers, the numbers almost guarantee it. But they might be three or 400 light years away. They might be on the other side of the Milky Way. We don't know. Have they been here? That's the next question I get the answer. I said, look, if you can develop craft that are capable of interstellar travel, then you can develop craft 
that can't be seen if you don't want to be seen. If you do want to be seen, you're not going to be seen by some farmer in Uzbekistan. You're going to sit down on the White House lawn and step out and say, how do you do? There's no in between. They don't come here and visit to, to taunt us unless unless the mark of an advanced civilization is a really advanced, well-developed sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I for a couple things. Um, one of our co-hosts who couldn't be here is cheering right now, Russ. Like I'm, I'm digging in deeper here for you, man. Aside from you know the typical hillbillies who tend to see UFOs, there have been some Navy F-16 pilots in recent years who have chased some interesting things. And I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of um, von Neumann probes. And I feel like there was some uh, astrophysicist who came up with some calculations saying if you if a civilization got advanced enough to make a self-replicating probe, that probe could go and make copies of itself and sort of geometrically expand in every direction. So it's covering the galaxy in something like 10 million years without needing light speed travel, basically, right? I feel like it's an underserved idea in science fiction, at least contemporary stuff, where it's like people want it to be flesh and blood aliens, but it's probably more likely that it would be some sort of vestige of artificial intelligence from a ancient civilization that might no longer exist. Is that something you've played with? How do you sort of feel about that as sort of like a practical reality? And do you think that there's any chance that that's responsible from some of the things people claim to see? Well, it's certainly possible. It's it's one of the more valid ideas. There actually was a show called uh, Alien Encounters, a multi-part show that I think, if I remember, was on the Science Channel. And they interviewed me and, and Dave Gerald and Neil deGrasse Tyson. And it was essentially that idea. Um, you know, mysterious alien artifact shows up. Nobody knows what it got a little fantasy oriented, a little science fiction oriented. But they did try to play with that idea. And uh, but I haven't done it in my fiction. No, um, I like to go out there rather than stay here. That's just my, that's just what I prefer to do. Uh, I've done near future science fiction, but I much prefer further future science fiction because it lets me explore the galaxy. Uh, if somebody else is exploring the galaxy and comes here, let somebody else write about that. But that certainly is a valid notion, a valid idea. But again, uh, I, I don't think we would uh, pick up on it in the way that, say, Navy pilots, for example, have picked up on stuff. I think you'd see something much more concrete. You would see something set down. It might just study us and then depart. It might not try to communicate with us at all. But I don't think it would be a blip on somebody's screen and then just disappear. Uh, except for Iamuamua, if I pronounced that correctly, which popped in here at the wrong angle for a comet and which one scientist has proposed actually was an alien probe. Uh, that's almost heartbreaking. I don't even like to think about that. It, yeah, it's like extrasolar artifact that it, it, who knows how rare something like that is to come through. I think they've discovered two, and the second one was a lot less interesting. Yeah, I mean, we actually did make contact, but they weren't interested in us, or it's going to go back and it'll be a hundred like it'll be a hundred years before they get back to us again, or two hundred years or something. That's almost heartbreaking that we couldn't send a probe of our own out there to check it out. It was probably just a big, funny-looking rock. But now we'll never know because we don't have a optical telescope that could have photographed it when we noticed it. It was already on its way out by the time people really got a hold of uh, Amuamua. But I'm I, I'm so glad you brought that up. And um, I I guys, I'm I'm done, and I thoroughly appreciate you indulging those questions. Sure. Oh no, that's what we're all here for. Yeah, this is delightful. As somebody who's more tangentially interested in this sort of thing, I just I was just soaking that in for the last ten minutes. Yeah, this was a uh, a good time. Like I said, uh, I think uh, all my questions were answered without them ever being asked, which was great. <laughs> well, my wife thinks I'm an alien, but if I, if I'm a probe and not aware of it, um, you know, that's a story. That's a storyline I actually have explored, not in relation to me personally, but you know, somebody who actually is construct a construct by aliens, who is placed here to study us and looks just like a person and has no idea that he is an alien construct. I did that in a book called The Eye Inside. So I guess I did do some of that. That does interest me. Does interest me. But if there's a probe here, you know, why should it look like anything we would recognize? And why couldn't it look like something we would recognize immediately but not react to? 
<laughs> like I, I'm so glad we went we went there. Um, you have been a absolutely wonderful guest and answered everything I was possibly looking for. And if we're so lucky, hopefully Zach can have that conversation with you about uh, more contemporary Star Wars issues. <laughs> um, is there anything else, uh, Rob and Zach, that you want to cover? My thirst has been thoroughly quenched. Yeah, I, I think uh, everything I was looking for was answered. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you, Mr. Foster. It's been beyond a pleasure. Uh, my pleasure, and people can find my stuff in the usual places if they want to hear from me even more. Yes, we will link to all this into the show notes. We'll have a laundry list. Everybody go and get the director should have shot you, for sure. I'm. It's on my agenda. Solely based on that title alone. <laughs> All right, so conclude this episode of Knights of Vader Star Wars podcast. Check out our Facebook group. Type in Knights of Vader into Facebook, and you will find us there waiting for you. Follow us on Instagram at KOV Podcast. Shoot us an email, kovpodcast at gmail.com. If you like what you hear, please rate, review, subscribe to us on iTunes or whatever podcasting platform you're currently listening to us on. Thank you to An Inspiriority Complex for providing our theme song. Check you're out welcome. the show notes. You thank you, Rob. <laughs> Check out the show notes to hear more from them. If you have any more interest in hearing Rob and I, check us out on the Cinemodies podcast as we delve into Monstober for all sorts of Halloween and uh, spooky related movie fare. Um, but when you're not listening to the Cinemodies podcast, where people find you, Mr. Chris Porteous? You can find me at the Chris Porteous on Instagram, and I am taking care of the Knights of Vader Instagram as well at KOV Podcast. And I thank you every day for that. And Rob, what are you up to when you're not uh, listening to this podcast? Uh, like Zach said, check us out at Cinemodities uh, Late Night Movies with Rob and Zach. We are talking about some great Monstober Halloween madness. It's a good time. Uh, come and join us. Thanks, Zach, for having me here. Our pleasure. And also, once again, just I know we've said it a couple of times now, but Mr. Foster, thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been surreal having this chat with you after seeing your no your name on so many novels over my lifetime. Never mind my co-host. This is a uh, truly a blessing. Thank you so much for devoting time to this, and we look forward to the opportunity of having you on again to talk about your uh, um, episode nine script treatment. Yes, thank you. This was great. You're most welcome, and I can recommend everybody to go see Morons from Outer Space, which is an old British film, which will tell you everything you want to know about interstellar travel. Very nice. Alrighty, good night, but not goodbye. And as always, may the force be with you. Bye.